It's the year 2020. Through the decades, we've increased our ability to organize and change the world around us. Advances in food production mean that even as the world's population explodes, nobody should be going hungry. Modern medicine means most of us are living longer, healthier lives. And yet, all the signs couldn't protect us from a pandemic. But a closer look will tell us it's because of our way of life that we're vulnerable to new infectious diseases, not in spite of it. And it's that same way of life that is setting us up for further outbreaks. We're so advanced, we're so clever. And yet, a tiny virus can cause havoc around the world. DW's Nina Raddy takes a look at just how we got here. COVID-19 is an unprecedented global health emergency in many ways. But the emergence of the new disease is also part of an alarming pattern. Scientists say the number of new infectious diseases in humans like SARS, MERS and COVID-19 has risen dramatically over the last decades. A study showed that the number of emerging infectious diseases in humans almost quadrupled between 1940 and 2000. An especially large spike in the 1980s was attributed to diseases linked to the HIV-AIDS epidemic. And there's not just more types of diseases. The number of outbreaks is rising too. In fact, the number of outbreaks of all diseases has roughly tripled since 1980. If you sat down systematically, and um, counted up the number of new infections that we have identified, it has increased. We continue to see increasing infectious disease outbreaks caused by bacteria or viruses that we did not previously know. We have created the circumstances on Earth that make it likely that this will continue. So what's causing the rise of new infectious diseases in our world today? And how do humans contribute? The reasons are varied, but they're all intertwined. So let's take a look at some of the main ones. Population size. There are more and more of us on the planet. When the Spanish flu broke out in 1918, there were around 1.8 billion people across the globe. By the 1970s, there were already 3.7 billion of us. In the past 50 years, the global population has more than doubled and it's projected to grow even further by 2050. More people also means we live closer together. And in some parts of the world, that means very close. This makes human-to-human -human transmission of viruses easier. And the sheer amount of people makes it more likely that one of us will catch a virus as we spread out on the planet. Human interference with nature. More people have led to an increased need for land and production capacity. The result? A rise in deforestation and land use change worldwide for industrial agriculture, logging and mining, or urbanization. This means humans come into increased contact with wild animals that may carry infectious diseases. Also, natural habitats are destroyed, driving animals into suburban areas where they encounter people and livestock. It is often the changes in the landscape driven by increases in population that has brought us into closer contact with the viruses that were already present in animals or present in the environment, but we now have created a much larger interface and are much more likely to come into contact with them. Studies have linked deforestation to increases in malaria infections in the Amazon region and to the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. But the risks of human interference with nature don't stop there. Human-driven climate change can also contribute to new disease outbreaks. Events like droughts can force wild animals to move away from their habitats. And disease-carrying insects like mosquitoes or ticks living in warmer areas are more likely to spread to new regions as global temperatures rise. Mass consumption of animal products. More people also means we need more food and intensified farming. As average global wealth has increased, so has the consumption of animal products. Though numbers vary by country, the average meat consumption per capita 
has risen from 23 kilograms per year in 1961 to nearly double that some 50 years later. Higher demand means more mass animal farming, which increasingly looks like this. Animals are squeezed together over long periods of time in an extremely small space. As farming intensifies, so does human-to-animal contact. And transporting these animals internationally elevates the risk of a virus spreading around the world. Global mobility. When it comes to spreading a virus, it's not only goods moving across borders. It's our own movement in a globalized world that plays a central role. COVID-19 is evidence of this, a virus which spread across the globe in a matter of weeks, causing a pandemic and infecting millions of people worldwide. In the past century, growing average wealth and cheaper flights have allowed us to travel more, faster, and easier than ever before. In 2018, over 4 billion passengers boarded flights worldwide. Half a century earlier, in 1970, it was only around 310 million. While at the beginning of the century in 1900, well, the first plane hadn't even lifted off yet. This is not new in history. I mean, people traveling along the Silk Road in past centuries and ships that carried passengers that had cholera. But the scale and magnitude of travel today, at least until the past few months, is really unmatched in history. And today, one can reach virtually any part of the Earth within the incubation period of many infectious diseases. But it's not all bad news. While the number of diseases is increasing, we are also better equipped to respond to them. In the past century, researchers have developed better tools to detect, research, and develop treatments and vaccines for diseases, making many of them far less deadly, like HIV, or virtually eradicating them like smallpox. When I think of HIV AIDS, I remember when the first cases we were uh, seeing in the hospital and initially it was a death sentence. Over the years, extremely effective treatment became available and it is now um, treated like a chronic disease. So on the one hand, things are getting better, but COVID-19 is proof that it is far from over. In a world as it looks today, there is no way around new diseases emerging. We will have to learn to fight them. And the coronavirus pandemic is teaching us how. I think COVID-19 has had a number of lessons already. One, we need a strong public health system. We also need to continue investment in basic science and in vaccine development, even in the absence of an epidemic, and we need better surveillance systems that integrate information about humans and animals. I am optimistic that we will be able to provide interventions, but it will take time. And Professor Friedemann Weber is director and chair of the Institute for Virology at the Justus Liebig University Gießen, where he focuses on veterinary medicine. First of all, it's good to have you with us. And let me start by picking up on that last point that was mentioned in our report just now, where it said we need better surveillance systems that integrate information about humans and animals. Now, can you give us an example where such a surveillance system already exists and discovered a disease and prevented it from spreading? I can give you a very well-known example, actually. There's, it doesn't entirely prevent the spread, but certainly like uh, um, have, has prevented a larger outbreak. That is influenza, and this is done every year. Every year, the influenza strains in China are being surveyed by the WHO, and this gives us a chance to predict what kind of influenza strains are coming over to the other countries. And um, this gives us, buys us about half a year's time to manufacture tailor-made vaccines. This would not be possible without this early warning system. So that's an example from human medicine, if you want. Yeah, it, just, it, it seems to be working perfectly well. What needs to be improved in order to get a, a better idea about the health of, of animals and humans? Well, all over, I think it is important important to test like help, everything, if you want. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what do we want to look at. Is it at the known viruses? For these, we can test very in a targeted manner, or for unknown ones. For this, it's a bit more complicated. For this, we need to wait for a disease to come up, if you want. So, 
uh, in this report, we also heard about uh, the role of biodiversity and uh, how uh, humans interfere with the world. Uh, how big a role does biodiversity play for our health? Uh, a very big uh, uh, role, of course. And for viruses, it's a bit complicated because if you have a huge repertoire of different animal species, that means you have a huge repertoire of different viruses. And some of them have the capability to jump into humans, others not. But the more different species you have, the higher the chances are. But once you have a, um, a virus which spreads very well, either in different animals and humans, or just in different animals, and it mutates over, then it's better to have a, a, a smaller variety of species, but many different individuals of it. So it can go through like through a monoculture. And uh, we're obviously doing an awful lot uh, in order to, to lower the amount of, of biodiversity around us. Now, renowned primatologist Jane Goodall actually blames COVID-19 on our exploitation of the natural world. She said that we brought this on ourselves. Does she have a point there? She definitely has a point. I mean, this is uh, um, simply about the chances of getting into contact with exotic viruses. And they come from exotic animals. And when do we meet exotic animals? So this is, for example, on these wet markets in China or when there's a bush meat market in Africa. But even it doesn't mean to need to be necessarily exotic because uh, uh, diseases like influenza, for example, they come from pigs and, and birds which means birds means chicken and, and ducks, or from cattle, we have caught measles once. So it's always the same. When you come in close contact to animals you may have never met before, then chances are high you get a virus from them. All right, so we'd be well advised to change our behaviour just a little bit. Professor Weber from the Institute of Virology in Gießen, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Bye-bye, Miss Jones. And talking of time, it's now time for your questions. Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Are all the new infections due to social distancing norm violations or in spite of following them? I'd say uh, both. Some people are, of course, going to be infected with the virus as a direct result of ignoring lockdown rules. Uh, there have been a few high profile cases where that's happened recently, like the Belgian prince who came down with COVID-19 after going to a party in Spain. But, but sticking strictly to social distancing rules, like staying two meters away from others, uh, doesn't mean you're completely protected. Among other things, we're still learning about how long exactly the virus stays airborne. Um, the latest indicator is that tiny drops, aerosols, that, that could potentially carry the virus can remain suspended in the air in enclosed spaces for, for over 10 minutes. So although there's lots of evidence that social distancing rules lower your risk, sometimes significantly, um, nobody is saying they provide any ironclad guarantees. Do I have to clean packaging on products before storing them at home? I get asked this question all the time because we all have to eat, right? And, and since you don't know who's handled those groceries you just picked up, it, it's easy to worry about how much of a danger they, they might pose. But although SARS-CoV-2 appears to remain viable on some surfaces for up to 72 hours, most experts at this point don't recommend that you disinfect packaging because it appears to pose quite a low risk. Um, the primary way the virus spreads seems to be through the air, rather than through direct physical contact with objects that might bear the pathogen. But of course, it's still a good idea to, to wash your hands thoroughly after shopping and, and putting away your groceries. What about the fatal effects of long-term unemployment? There's widespread acceptance of the idea that, that long-term unemployment affects both your mental and your, and your physical health, that people who are out of work for longer periods are, are more anxious or depressed than the average and are at higher risk of, of strokes and cardiovascular disease or, or other serious illnesses. But I found it surprisingly difficult to track down recent studies on the topic that, that tried to quantify the health effects of unemployment 
across the board. Um, one that was conducted in Sweden last year determined in a survey involving around a thousand adults that, that taking many different health factors into account, um, unemployment hits people quite hard, both emotionally and physically. And if it does that in a place like Sweden, which has quite an extensive social safety net, the impact is likely to be felt even more in other countries.